Well, I'd like to, thank, uh, to welcome everybody who's joining with us this evening to our evening worship. And I pray that we will know the Lord's blessing as we worship together, even if it's from different parts of, of the community. I would like to start by uh, making a call to worship, and it's from the chapter 22 of Revelation, and um, from verse 17, Revelation 22 at verse 17, and it says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come, and, wh and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Can we now uh, go to our singing, and we're going to sing from Psalm number one, Psalm number one in the Scottish Psalter, a version of Psalm number one. The man of perfect blessedness, who walketh not astray in counsel of ungodly men, nor stands in sinner's way. Join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. O eternal and ever blessed God, as we come before you at this time, we realize above all else that you are indeed the true and holy God, that you are the God who created this world, and you are the God who created each and every one of us. And this day, Lord, we ask that you would help us to draw near to yourself. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who could see the difficulties that man got into because of our sin, because of our waywardness. We even sinned from the very beginning. 
when Adam and Eve went against your instructions in the Garden of Eden. And from then on, we have sinned day and daily. But, O oh Lord, we thank you that you sent the Lord Jesus Christ into this world to die for sinners such as we are. That he was the one that not only taught and not only uh, performed great miracles, but he was the one who went to the cross of Calvary. And there he took our sin away. He was the one who bore the sin of our sin on his shoulders. It was for our sake that he died on the cross. But, O oh Father, we thank you that it didn't end there, that on the third day he rose again, never to die. He rose and was seen among the people again and afterwards went into heaven. And there he pleads for us each and every day at your right hand. And, O oh Father, we just pray that you would be one who would continue with us, who would help us in all that we seek to do in your name. We pray, Lord, that you would um, draw in with us and help us, that you would guide us in the right paths to take, that you would guide us in the right way to be. We thank you, Lord, for being able to gather together in, even in small numbers and in and in, the, in our church once again. And we pray, Lord, that these freedoms will be extended, that we will be able to gather together and to worship you, to worship you in a right way, to be able to meet as brothers and sisters, and to be able to know and worship the true and living God. Oh, Father, we thank you that even although we've not been able to do these things, through the ways that, that technology has developed, that we have been able to be together in a way. We have been able to meet and uh, over Zoom and many other ways of doing it and see people and hear people. And we thank you for these things. And we pray, Lord, that as we are in this time of vacancy, that there will be a time will come when you will appoint a pastor over us, that you will be working in the heart of a man at this time that would come to be with us, and that you will be guiding our hearts and minds to that uh, particular pastor. And we pray, Lord, that de through that we will be united congregation and pastor again, and that we will be able to do good in this community, and that we will be able to reach out and that we will be able to touch those who need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. O oh, Father, we pray too for the situation in our world where there is much COVID in many places and we would remember the country of India today and the surrounding countries in Pakistan and Bangladesh and in, and in Nepal where there is heavy um, instances of COVID. And we pray, Lord, that even in their need and in their lack of resource, that you will be there and that you would touch people's hearts and minds, that they would turn to yourself and realize that you are indeed the God who cares for them. And for other parts of the world where there is troubles and uh, political troubles, we remember the problems in Israel and in Palestine. And we pray, Lord, again, that you would open the eyes of both Jew and Gentile to see that there is a Savior, for them to realize that the Messiah has come and he will come again to judge the earth and all, the, the, all our actions will be judged openly and honestly the, the actions of those who are per perpetrating these things at this time. We pray, Lord, that you would have mercy. And so, Lord, we ask now that as we read your word and as we think on it, you will guide us, you will lead us, and you will give us the words and thoughts and that you want us to see 
And we ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I'd like to read this evening in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, and at verse 19, down to the end. Down to the end of the chapter. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, a pity of me, and sent Lazarus to dip the tongue of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And beside all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets, Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Amen, and may the Lord bless that reading to us. And so as we look into this part of Scripture, we see that this is a very solemn parable. It talks about the realities of life and death. It also talks about the contrast between rich and poor, and certainly between rich and poor in this life. But it also talks about the contrast between the lost and saved in the life to come. It shows us very plainly the difference between the condition of a saint in heaven and a sinner lost in hell. So let's have a wee bit closer look at the parable itself. First of all, we have a description of a rich man. This is a man who would say in everyday language today, he was a man of consequence. He was a man of wealth. And more than likely, he was a man of position. It says that he wore linen, and it was the color of purple. And that in itself in Jesus' day, would tell anybody who was looking on in this man that this was a very well-to-do person. Purple was a much-prized color, and because it was very difficult to produce, and because of the cost of it and, and the production of it, it became a symbol of wealth and power. Roman emperors wore purple. People who were extremely wealthy, who were very well to do, they wore purple. And that that shows that how well off this man was and, and how respected he would have been. Not only that, but the parable goes on to say that he lived well every day. He lived well every day. And that means nowadays, as we would say, money was no object. And this man didn't stint himself. He would be very well respected and looked up to. And we could well ask in many ways, what harm is there in this? He didn't get his wealth dishonestly, or it doesn't say he didn't. He got his wealth dishonestly or by any type of extortion or anything like that. He was just a man who had done well for himself. And you know, Jesus himself said it was not wrong to have things. It is not wrong to work hard and to earn a good living to have a nice home or possessions. The problem is when, like this man, the making or holding on to earthly things becomes an obsession that blocks out 
the needs of his fellow man. But even worse still, it blocks out the person's need to know of God and his grace. Makes a person to be content with the world and have no thought of the next. This is so like the man who who built the barns because of the Lord's goodness to him. This man would have been a farmer and he had very, very good crops. And he said, well, to have all these crops, I need to build a barn. And he planned so much in the building of these barns and laid great store on them that that night God came to him and said, tonight I require your soul. And all the man's planning and all his things was left to nothing. He died and was no more. So for this moment, let's leave the rich man and let us now look at the state of the poor man. You know, we live in a world of contrasts. And it's shown very clearly in this parable, the contrast is in it. Because when Jesus goes on to tell us about the poor man, it's very different from a description of the rich man. Here is a man who has nothing, certainly not anything of this world's goods. He was a beggar. Because not only did he have no possessions, but it would seem that he had poor health. Because as it says, he was taken each day, carried to the gate of this rich man and laid there in the hope that somebody would be kind to him. Also, it says that he was full of sores and would probably be dirty and he would be dressed in rags. Somebody of no consequence. Somebody to avoid. Somebody who had no self-esteem or ambition but somebody who would be happy with a few crumbs from the rich man's table. And so here we have the everyday description of two men whose lives are so different. The one has got everything, and the one has nothing. And yet they would have seen each other every day, as the rich man would have gone in and about his business. He would have seen Lazarus lying there, calling out for help. But as we read, the rich man didn't help him. And probably many of those who went into rich man didn't help either. But you know, the story goes on and it tells us that Lazarus died. No longer would he be begging at the gate of the rich man. And for all we know, the rich man might have said, well, I'm glad that beggar is no longer here. He's no longer here to bother me. He is no longer here to trouble my conscience in any way. I can go in and out and be free of this man. But you know, the rich man died also. And is this not a a solemn thing? Death respects nobody. Rich and poor, young and old, all must die. We read in Genesis that through sin, death entered into the world and all must die. It is solemn to read the account of all of Adam's descendants in Genesis, where it says, and they died. Each name and the years they lived, and they died. The great leveler, death itself. Death is the thing that levels everybody out. Everybody has to die. So now we see Jesus going on to talk about these two men after death and how they find themselves in the next world. And if we go back again to the rich man, let's have a look at him first. I'm sure he would have had a splendid funeral. It would have been well attended and I'm sure talked about many times. A great event befitting a great man, as many would say. It would have been a funeral that people would have been anxious to go to. That would have, they would have turned up and there would be great ceremony and pomp. But you know, he finds himself in hell in a great torment. In a place of utter hopelessness. Endless, useless, and with no remedy. But even worse, the God that he denied is there in front of him. And the man he has mistreated or didn't treat well at all in this world is there with God. 
but he now sees the beggar is in a better place. And also he realizes that it's a long way from where he is himself. And so in his torment, he cries out in anguish that Lazarus would come and help him. He cries out to Abram because Abram is in heaven. And as we see, the beggar was elevated to be with him. So this man calls out to Abram that Lazarus would come and give him a drop of water. A drop of water to ease the torment he's in. He calls out for mercy one who himself never seemed to show mercy. So how does Abraham answer him? At first he told him, Son, remember the good things that you received from God. Remember all of these things. Remember how you used them. Remember how you held on to them, to the exclusion of others and to the exclusion of God himself. You left it too late not only to show mercy, but even worse for you, for to show mercy. Because it is in this life that people must make the change from following the world to following Christ. It is, we, it is here where the opportunities are. The opportunities is given and now is the accepted time. This man thought that life in a way would go on forever. And when his life was over, that certainly he would never think there would be a place like hell. How wrong he was. Have he now found himself there? And how many today will find themselves in the same position? You know, I was, I was watching the television, I think it was um, on Friday night, and they were talking about looking to see how people could live forever. But you know, there is people can live forever, but they need to know Jesus Christ before they can do that. There is no, I don't think they will ever manage to have medical developments that will able, enable people to live forever. But if we know Christ, we know that we will live forever. And you know, when we read this account of the rich man's talk with Abram, it's like for the first time he's starting to think of others. He realizes that his family are heading in the same way. And he pleads with Abraham that Lazarus will go back and be able to speak to his family. Why does he ask that Lazarus will be sent back to speak to his family? Why does he want Lazarus to, to, to talk to his family? Well, he realizes his most terrible position. And that if he was to go back himself and describe his position to them, he would frighten them out of their wits. But if Lazarus was to go back and, and they would have known Lazarus in, in, in his life, his testimony would have a positive effect on them. But you know, this wasn't, even this wasn't granted. Abraham said to him, they have the scriptures, let them listen to what they have to say on these issues of life and death, of heaven and hell. But the man said to him, No, Abraham, I know these people. It's not enough to persuade them. But if some supernatural thing happens, then they will repent. But once again, the request is turned down. Abraham repeats to him, They have the scriptures. This is the divine way laid down for people not only to believe in the truth of Scripture, but also to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what will save us from this hell that this rich man found himself in. This was a man who had everything in this life, who lived his life to the full, as we would say, who enjoyed the good things of this life, but never sought God, never realized it, he had to repent, thought that his riches and his life would go on forever. And now he finds himself in a lost eternity. And we've looked there for a little time at the hopelessness of this poor soul, lost in the torment of hell. Because he is a poor soul, 
despite all that he had in this world. He has nothing now. He has no hope. He's lost for eternity. But what of Lazarus, the poor man of this world? We also read that he died and that the angels carried his soul, as we've seen, into Abraham's bosom. This was at a man who had loose holds in the things of this world, but had good grip in the things of the next. He was a man who in this world and had faith in a good and loving God, a God who would take care of his never-dying soul, a God that loved those he created so much that he gave his son for them, that they could be reconciled to himself that they would not be lost, that they would be reconciled to the true and living God, that they would be ones who would know him for all of eternity. He hadn't got much in this world. He had little to show for being here. But he had that faith, he had that faith that enabled him to spend a glorious eternity with Jesus, with God. No more sorrow, no more pain or tears, but everlasting peace, true peace with the Father. And you know, this is something that we have to, to learn, that we're not here forever, that we're not able to hold on to the possessions that we have that the Lord has blessed us with. And we have to realize that many don't have that, that many have nothing but the faith they have in Christ. And that's a wonderful thing, to be able to know that you are safe in his hands. And you know, often I used to see Roma gypsy people in Romania with absolutely nothing. And I really mean absolutely nothing. Bare feet and at minus 10 to 20 outside. And they had nothing, but they had Christ. And you could see it in their faces. They could see that he is the one who has, who has brought them into his kingdom. And they often talked about when they came into his kingdom, they would have a mansion and that the streets would be paved with gold. They really believed it. They really understood it. And even though everything was so dreadful round about them, they knew that God cared for them. They knew that God was concerned for them. And we have to be the same. Yes, we can have things and we can have stuff of this world. But if we keep it in proportion, that we have to look to Christ first before anything else. And that we don't rely on these things. And that we always remember that there is a God and there is a God who we have to stand before. So what can we learn from this solemn parable? Well, first of all, that there is a heaven and a hell, and that is obvious. Next, that the destination of everybody's soul is either one or the other. We know that those who follow the Roman Catholic faith say there is a place in the middle. But there is no place in the middle. There is only a heaven or hell. That is the only, that there is only two kinds of people in this world. Those who are going to heaven and those who are going to hell. Now we also have to realize that different from the parable that we've read, there will be rich people in heaven. The same as there will be poor people in hell. That rich and poor in terms of wealth in this world will it be in either one or the other. Thirdly, that it is in this life that where we spend eternity is settled. It is here that the gospel is presented to people. It is here that God's mercy is shown. It is here that people must repent and confess their sin. It is here that we must accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. And you know, we must think of this very carefully. Each and every time the gospel is proclaimed or read, it's a call for us to repent, to close in with Jesus, so that we can also enjoy what Lazarus enjoys, 
everlasting peace. Everlasting peace. There will be nothing that will bring any mar or, or harm to the joy of heaven. It will be peace and it will be everlasting. The alternative is a place where the rich man has found himself. You know, this poor rich man has found himself in a place of lost eternity. And it's a real hopelessness. It's a real everlasting hopelessness of hell that is, that is really frightening. That is something that should make us really think. You know, we may have been in what we perceived as hopeless positions before, but nothing is as hopeless as this. The day of salvation has gone past. The day of, being, of turning to Christ has gone past. And we will be there and there will be nothing but hopelessness. There will be nothing but thinking on the things that we've done wrong how we have rejected God's love, how we rejected his mercy. But you know, that doesn't need to be the case. The case is that we have to seek God's mercy, pray that he will grant us mercy, that he will help us to believe in the Lord Jesus and to escape this judgment. There is no escape from the judgment that is to come but the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one who was able to save us. He is the only one who was willing to save us. And we have to put our, our faith and our hope in this grace that comes from God, that he would save us and that he would enable us to enjoy an eternity with him. And you know, I was when I think back over the years when Many years ago, when we were going to the church in Kiltern, Reverend John Mackenzie was a minister there, and invariably he would end his sermons by saying, there is a heaven to win and a hell to shun. And that is so true. It is so true. We need to put our faith in Christ. We need to shun this hell that will be the place for those who refuse to believe. May the Lord help us, and may the Lord bless these thoughts to us. Amen. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. O eternal and ever gracious God, we just ask that you would help us to know you, to know your goodness, to know your grace and mercy not to hold on to the things of this world, but to know your blessing, to know your grace and mercy, to know that you are indeed the God of salvation. And so we pray this day, Lord, that you would help each and every one of us to know you as Lord and Savior, to know your blessings and to know your goodness. And we pray that for the many who are on that road to destruction, that you would stop them in their tracks and that you would help them to turn to yourself and be able to enjoy an eternity, a blessed eternity away from troubles, away from tears, away from the things that disturb us and just knowing that there will be an eternity of grace and an eternity of mercy, and that there will be joy and, and everlasting praising of the true and living God. And so, Lord, help us in these things and just keep us on the right path. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Our closing... Uh, singing the, this evening is from Psalm 84 to the tune homes of Donegal. Uh, Psalm 84 in the Scottish Psalter. How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts to me, the tabernacles of thy grace, how pleasant, Lord, they be.
Let us pray. And now, O Lord, we ask that you would part us with your blessing. And may your grace, mercy, and peace be with each and every one of us, now and forevermore. Amen.